any case, I'm Lee Pessler. I'm a neurosurgeon. Uh, we've been doing more and more. <laughs> <laughs> more and more neurosurgery here and, and as we do you know that in the past community neurosurgery centers have been more simple discs and orthopedic procedures uh, blood clots uh, things of that nature nowadays and certainly here where we're considered more even though it's a community hospital it's more of a tertiary center with a name brand that people are coming to and we're really trying to establish that um, we're progressing a little bit more with the complexity of cases that we do. And certainly now, um, with Dr. Marhotra and the Cancer Center uh, being formed here, we're really concentrating on bringing in cancer cases, bringing in more complex brain <coughs> tumors. And along with that comes tumors in the skull base that traditionally were in tertiary or quaternary centers. Um, being sent there, again, because of the complexity, because of the instruments involved, and, and because of where this is, as you'll see. And so what I want to do today is give you a, a very basic overview of the anatomy of the skull base, what kind of tumors we can expect there, and then how do we go about doing this. And this is actually quite timely. We've done a couple of these cases here. We actually just transferred in a patient last night and have a, another case upcoming on Thursday, exactly what you're going to see here. So. Again, we'll start with the basic anatomy of what's going on. How do people present? So how do you know that you have a tumor of your skull base? What are the different pathologies that we might encounter here? And then what do we do about it? And that's going to be the main focus of what you guys are involved in is the what do we do about it part of it. And you'll see as we go on that it's not that complex. So the anatomy, we're looking at the skull base here. And by the skull base, I mean this is where the brain is. This is where the brain sits in the skull. The cerebellum is back here. This is the skull base, so right along the bottom of the skull. And what we're going to be interested in is the area of the nose. And so these are the ethmoid sinuses here, right through the nose. This is the sphenoid sinus. And so this is where you're breathing through. This is when you have sinus surgery because you're all clogged up. This is the area here that, that gets clogged up that they clean out. But this is really the focus of our area. So this is what's called the cella. The cella is what contains the pituitary gland, which actually sits at the bottom of the brain. So the pituitary gland is not in the brain itself. It sits off the bottom of the brain, and it really controls hormone levels in the body. That's its main function. So we're going to be concerned with the pituitary, the cella, and relations around that. So the supracellar region, so the area above the pituitary, that's still not within the brain and the area of the clivus. The clivus is this base of the skull, and it's a bony area that can, the tumors can arise. In. And you can imagine that if we were going to try to approach this from anywhere outside of the head, it's really a long distance to get here. And so we're going to go over not only those approaches, but also approaches through the nose itself. So this is what it looks like on an MRI. This is a sagittal MRI. Here's the pituitary gland lighting up here. So the reason that it's bright here is there's an avid blood supply because, again, it supports and provides hormones to the rest of the body. It has to travel in the bloodstream. And so here's what it looks like here. That's that same picture we were looking at before with the pituitary gland here through the nose. These are the sinuses here. This is mucosa of the sinuses. And this is the brain here, brain stem, brain cerebellum. So a little zoomed in view of that shows us again the pituitary gland and more important than that are the structures that are around it. And so here we have the pituitary stalk, which is right here. Okay. And this right here are the optic nerves. Right here is the optic nerve and we'll see better pictures of that, but those are the nerves that actually provide sight. You can imagine that if something grows in the region of the pituitary and pushes up on the optic nerve, it's going to cause a compromise of your vision. And that's one of the main complaints that people have that we'll look at. 
other anatomy in this region. So this is looking at a coronal view. This is that pituitary gland and the optic chiasm, again, with the pituitary stalk coming down. And so we also have the carotid arteries that are on either side of the pituitary gland, and that supplies blood to essentially the entire brain. This is what's called the cavernous sinus. These have uh, nerves in it that control movement of the eye. And so you can see all these things are relatively close to each other. In fact, the area from here to here only extends about three centimeters or so. It's not very big. Um, the typical dimensions of here is only about a centimeter and a half. And so really there's not a lot of space in this area. And even small tumors can compromise vision can compromise movement of the eye. And of course, even just getting there, these carotid arteries, they're beautiful on this picture, but they don't always look like that. <coughs> sometimes they're closer together, sometimes they're a little asymmetric. And here's what it looks like on the MRI. And so you see the optic chiasm, <coughs> like we see here, the pituitary stalk, pituitary gland, and then the carotid arteries here. So this is our main corridor that we're going through. And again, that's sometimes no bigger than two and a half to three centimeters. So a very small area that we're trying to get into. And again, we'll go over this again, but you can imagine trying to get to this area from anywhere in the brain. I mean, this is dead center in the middle of the head. And you really have to go through very normal anatomy just to get there. So how do people present with this? Well, as we saw, we're right near those optic nerves. And so you can have visual difficulty. And I'll show you exactly the visual difficulty that you have, but it's essentially tunnel vision. You lose your peripheral vision. So it's like you're looking through a telescope. It's like you can't see in the periphery. The other thing that we see are endocrinopathies. So again, pituitary gland produces hormones. One of the main hormones that's affected is prolactin. Prolactin causes lactation. Um, <laughs> I'm actually remembering back, I, I must have been in I don't know, junior high school or something like that, and you're walking in the supermarket and you see these sort of, you know, Sun magazine, not the Inquirer, I'm talking about the really trashy, weird things where they, before Photoshop and the pictures just look terrible. And I remember this headline, it said, Steve produces milk. And they showed this, like, naked guy with his nipple with milk coming out. And it was like this very strange thing. It's not so strange, I see it all the time. And it's because if men, the prolactin levels become high, men can lactate, men can produce milk. So that's something that we see also. And then more common than not, we find these things incidentally. So these are in the middle of the head. They're not in the brain itself. Sometimes the vision's not even affected that much. Um, and, and nowadays, every neurologist, some medical doctors have MRI scanners in their office. You go to your doctor, you tell them you had a bad dream last night, they're gonna say, yeah, we need to get you an MRI just to make sure. <laughs> and we're finding a lot of these incidentally. And I'll explain what we do with those. So the visual difficulty that you get is what's called a bitemporal hemianopia, and essentially that's what tunnel vision is. The reason that you get that, it's quite simple. The eye is divided into two halves. This is the temporal half of the eye that looks at nasal vision. So you can imagine this part of the back of the eye is looking this way. This part of the eye is looking this way. Same thing here. This part of the eye sees here, and this part sees here. So what you have is a tumor right in the middle, so like you see here, compresses the middle part, so that would be this area and this area. And that's what you don't see. So you don't see this area, and you don't see this area. So that's blacked out, and that's blacked out. And that's all it is, is you black out that peripheral vision. Now, sometimes it can take, people just don't realize that they have this. And I'll tell you, I oftentimes, after seeing patient after patient that doesn't realize it until it's too late, I'll sit there and wake up in the morning and just cover one eye and look to the side and make sure that I still have my peripheral vision. Because the most common reason that people come in with this complaint is that they're getting into accidents in, in parking lots of supermarkets, they're hitting the side of their car, they're going to change lanes and they don't realize a car is next to them. The, by far the most common way that this bitemporal hemianopsia presents. 
Because most of the time when you're looking and walking around, if you can't look on the side, you turn your head and you don't even realize it. You don't even think about it. And, and so this is a, the visual disturbance for the most part that you get. The way that we officially test this is what's called uh, Humphrey's Formal Visual Fields. You stick your head in this machine, they flash some lights, and this is what we see. That this whole area on the side, on either side, is blacked out. So you can't see on the sides. And again, you still can see in the middle, and so it takes a very long time before people actually realize that. Now we talked about the cavernous sinus. So here's a tumor of the pituitary gland, but it's also involving the side area, the cavernous sinus around the carotid artery, which is that dark area. Now, for the most part, these tumors are soft, so they don't compress the carotid artery. So we don't typically worry about strokes and things like that as presenting signs, but they do affect those nerves. Right? And those nerves allow for movement of the eye and also for the eyelid to be able to raise up. And so what you get is a ptosis, so a drooping of the eyelid, and the eye is deviated. And depending exactly which nerves are affected, the eye can be deviated in different directions, but you get double vision. Both eyes aren't looking at the same thing at the same time. And so that's what people will come in with. You know, I have double vision, and it's just not going away. And you get it, and that's what it looks like. So what are the different types of tumors that we're going to encounter here? What are the different kinds of things we're going to see in the operating room? There are three major areas that we're going to talk about, and they each have different pathologies associated with them. The supracellar region, so this is the cella. Supracellar, above the cella, in the cella, and then in the clitus. Those are the areas of the skull base that we're going to be focusing on. Now, here's a semi-exhaustive list of different things that we can find here. I'm going to go over just a few of the most common ones, not every single one, but a few of the most common ones so you know a little bit better about what we're going to see. Pituitary adenomas are by far the most common cellar lesions. All right? and this is a benign growth of the pituitary gland. This is not cancer. This never becomes cancer. There are two main types of pituitary adenomas. There are ones called secretory and non-secretory. And so either they produce a hormone, or they don't, and in, in which case, if they don't produce a hormone, they're just going to act on the rest of the brain and on the surrounding structures by mass effect, by pushing on them. <coughs> the secretory hormones are going to have an effect by producing that hormone. So you have galactorrhea, so again, that's producing milk. That can happen in men and women. Amenorrhea, that's a very common one. Women just, you know, for the last three or four months, I haven't had my period. And that's a very common complaint. Or at least something people talk about. I don't know if it's necessarily a complaint, depending on if people <laughs> want to get pregnant. ACTH, which is adrenal corticoid uh, trophic hormone, produces steroids in the body and allows the adrenal glands to produce steroids. And so you get what's called Cushing syndrome, which is the same effects that you get when people are on steroids for long periods of time. So you get the moon facies. Buffalo hump, weight gain, hypertension, easy bruising, osteoporosis, these abdominal stria that people get. Um, and, and it can take a long time for some of these, thing, these things to form, and sometimes people don't even realize it. Growth hormone. Gigantism is an obvious one. Andre the Giant had a pituitary adenoma causing gigantism. Um, acromegaly is one that's not as common. So this is after the growth plates have closed, you're an adult, and then you develop this. You get what's called acromegaly, which is that only certain parts of your body start growing. Your hands, your feet, your head, your nose. And so a very common question that we'll ask is, have you had to change your shoe size recently? I mean, most grown-ups don't have to change their shoe size after a certain age. If you start having to change your shoe size, your gloves, things like that, then that's an indication that you might have acromegaly something we can test for now, and of course with MRIs it becomes a little more obvious. The case that we're doing on Thursday is a case of pituitary apoplexy. So oftentimes pituitary adenomas can hemorrhage into themselves. So in other words, you get actually blood in that area. Now we think it's just because of necrosis, and if people don't have severe visual difficulty, it's not a rush you off to the operating room emergency. However, 
there are many cases where all of a sudden people will just either go blind or acutely lose their vision. Anyone with a headache and a potential visual loss, we scan, and sometimes they have this. Now what you're seeing here is normally on a non-contrast MRI, nothing in the brain or the pituitary should be bright. This is non-contrast. This is bright here, so that is blood. This is what it looks like with contrast, which looks essentially the same. It's pushing up on that optic chiasm. And so this is somebody that we have to take semi-emergently to the operating room to drain this, to take the pressure off of those optic nerves. Now again, the guy that we're going to do on Thursday has no visual disturbance. Um, and this is what it looks like before and afterwards. The pituitary apoplexies are quite simple cases in that when they're blood, they're generally liquefied. We can go in right away and we can take the pressure off of that nerve. This is immediately post-operatively. And we have now the, you can see the optic chiasm. It's very nice. It was compressed here. This all came down. Optic chiasm looks nice and the person can see it. When you do that for someone who has optic do they see immediately they get afterwards? That? Yep. Um, other common things that we see in this area are Rathke's cleft cysts, which are just like they sound cysts, so fluid filled spaces of the pituitary gland. These are embryologic remnants that sometimes grow, sometimes they don't. Um, and this is one that's often somewhat tricky. This happens uh, <coughs> predominantly in postpartum women. Uh, lymphocytic hypophysitis, which is not a tumor, which gets better on its own. This is an inflammatory condition. And one of the giveaways to this is the pituitary stalk itself. So right there, that pituitary stalk is actually enhancing also. And that normally does not do that. When that enhances, it might mean that there's some inflammatory reaction of the pituitary gland. Now, if a patient has visual loss, then we're sort of stuck and we have no choice but to go in and, and remove this inflammatory tissue. On the other hand, if we just see this for other complaints, headaches or, or you know, in, in non-postpartum women, amenorrhea, things like that, then we have the option of waiting if that's what we think it is because this is generally self-limiting and will get better on its own. One of the more common supracellar lesions is something called a craniopharyngioma. There's two peaks of this. So the majority of patients are young, they're children. This is what we see it in. We see um, problems with development, um, visual problems, hypothalamic dysfunction, which may mean weight gain, it may mean you know overeating, difficulty with water balance, so polyuria, polydipsia, so eating a lot, drinking a lot, that doesn't necessarily mean diabetes, which is what we associate it with. It can mean problems with your pituitary gland or your hypothalamus. Germinomas are another. So germinomas are also more of a childhood disease, but we do see them in adults sometimes. In fact, this was a 20-year-old kid that I saw um, he came in and he actually looked like he was about 14. Um, nobody had ever, they just thought that's the way he looked. Um, but he actually came in because all of a sudden he started peeing a lot, he started drinking a lot, um, and then he became very lethargic because his sodium balance was off. And this is what his scan looks like. This is what's called a germinoma. This has a supracellar component, which is the area that we were looking at before, and oftentimes has a pineal component. So an area in the back of the brain here too. This can be diagnosed sometimes just with serum blood lab tests, sometimes with cerebral spinal fluid. In cases like this, you can't do a lumbar puncture, so a spinal tap, because that can herniate the patient. You have a mass in the head causing obstruction of the ventricles, which is what we see here, some hydrocephalus. If you do a lumbar puncture, put a needle in the lower back and try to drain fluid out, you might herniate the patient. And so, in this case, we might need to get tissue some other way. And we can either go through the brain itself, or again, there may be a corridor through the uh, The area that we've concentrated on here to start with has been the clitus. <laughs> and so, the majority of uh, patients that I've done here to start with 
have been the Clivus, the, the clival region, because these are there's really no danger here of, of a lot of the complications that we associate with transphenoidal surgery, with going through the nose. Because this is in the bone, it's actually not in the cella, not in the supracellar region, but in the bone itself. And here we see some of the bone eaten away. Now, this can be plasmacytoma, which is a, a form of multiple myeloma. Metastases can go to the bone here, especially prostate cancer and breast cancer. And sometimes we have to operate on these just to find out what it is. Squamous cell carcinoma, especially direct extension from the sinuses, can erode into the clivus. And so there are different areas, different lesions that can appear. Like and then we have lesions that are in all three areas. So this was a 30-year-old girl that I saw that had transient double vision. Um, that had had craniospinal radiation when she was four years old for ALL. And this is an area now, it's in the clivus, the supracellar region, and the cellar region. So this is all three regions, and this has uh, turned out to be what's called the hemangiopericytoma, which is a type of meningioma. And so, when we see somebody with these, what do we do? Well, oftentimes, and I will tell you, more times than not, we observe these. Sometimes, especially with pituitary adenomas, if that's obviously what it looks like, there's nothing we have to do if we found it incidentally. If it's not touching the optic nerves, if it's not producing an endocrinopathy, a hormone disturbance that we can't correct, then oftentimes you just watch these and maybe they'll never grow. And in a large portion of, of patients, they never grow. We just continue to watch them. And watching them may mean a scan every year, may mean a scan every two years. These are not very fast-growing lesions. Medical management is another option. So let's say it is what's called a prolactinoma, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But prolactinomas can be treated with medication, and they'll actually shrink. Other endocrinopathies can also be treated with medication. Acromegaly, another uh, uh, can be treated with medication. The ACTH, those Cushing syndrome patients, can be treated with medication. And so that may be something that we do initially. Certainly metastases, plasma cytomas, uh, that multiple myeloma, any kind of metastasis can often be treated with chemotherapy. Something we don't have to worry about in this region is the blood-brain barrier. So one of the big problems with treating things in the brain with chemotherapy is what's called the blood-brain barrier. The brain's very protective of itself, doesn't allow chemotherapies and other compounds into the brain. This is outside of the blood-brain barrier, so things in the skull, things in the cella don't have to pass through that barrier, and so oftentimes, especially with metastases or other kinds of cancers, we can treat these with chemotherapy and, and not have to do that. Radiation, radiosurgery, so this has really been a, a great thing for treatment in this area. As you saw, this is in the center of the head. Just getting there can be a lot of trouble. If we can treat this with radiosurgery or radiation, which is non-invasive, that might be a better way to treat some of these lesions. Talk about that. And then surgery itself, and that's obviously going to be the focus of what we're going to be doing in the operating room and something I'll go over in detail. So once again, why do we decide to treat? Well, certainly if we find it incidentally, it's not compressing the optic nerves, we don't have to do anything. But if a patient has a visual deficit, we need to make that better, or at the very least, stop it from getting worse. Endocrinopathy is not corrected by medication. So prolactinomas, which are sort of the most common hormone-secreting adenomas, can be treated with what's called bromocryptine or cabergoline, but sometimes after years of treatment, it doesn't work anymore. Sometimes side effects from some of those medications are too much for patients to take, and they don't want to be treated with medication anymore. So that may be a reason for surgery or for other treatment. Fertility. Like I said, this can cause amenorrhea. If someone wants to get pregnant, they need to have this treated so that they can start having their period again. If we see growth on serial scans, so even if patients don't have visual field deficits or an endocrinopathy, if we've been following something for years and it starts growing and growing and growing, we may we want to intervene early so that patients don't develop visual field difficulties. It is much easier for us to fix a problem before it starts than to try to correct one once it happens.
diagnosis. So oftentimes, especially with the clival lesions, but sometimes with the cellar and supracellar lesions, we don't know what they are. They're just a mass that's there. We do a workup of the rest of the body. We don't find anything. And just in terms of a biopsy of getting a diagnosis, we have to do some form of surgery. And then hydrocephalus is, because this is pushing up, and as you saw with that germinoma, <laughs> this is pushing up on the ventricles. This can cause hydrocephalus, a blockage of the fluid drainage through the ventricles, requiring a shunt or requiring treatment of the lesion itself to help clear that blockage. So just an example of what treatment with a prolactinoma looks like. So this is a patient that had a prolactinoma. We treated with uh, bromocryptine, and within three months, it's already much better. You see how close it is to the optic chiasm here? Now it's, you know, miles away for all intents and purposes. So, and this will continue to get better and better. Chemotherapies. So here's your germinoma that I showed before with just three months of chemotherapy. It's already gone. We don't see it anymore. This is a very responsive tumor to chemotherapy and radiation and something that really just melts away with that, that we don't need to do any surgery. <coughs> so I mentioned radiation as another form of treatment, um, and it's been pretty good. Now, I will say radiation takes months to work sometimes. If someone has visual difficulty, if someone has problem with their cranial nerves where they're having double vision, they're not able to move their eye, radiation may not be the best way to go because it may take months to work and may just stabilize things. It may just make things not get any worse. The other problem with radiation is that, as you can see, the areas that we're radiating are right near the optic nerves, especially if someone has visual difficulties right on the optic nerves. Those optic nerves are very sensitive to radiation. So we think we're radiating the tumor, but we're also radiating those nerves, and it can only tolerate a certain amount. And so in certain cases, it's a good option. In other cases, it's not a great option. Radiosurgery, which is Gamma Knife, Cyber Knife, Novalis, Trilogy. There's a bunch of different versions of this now. But it's high-dose radiation, but it's very conformal, which means that we can really direct it at the tumor itself, deliver higher doses, and try to avoid complications to surrounding structures. In a lot of the studies that have been published, we have tumor control rates that approach 100%, so the tumor's not growing anymore. Some of them decrease in size. For prolactinomas and other hormone-secreting tumors, we can actually decrease the amount of hormones that are secreted. And so, again, these can be good options. However, like I mentioned, there are some complications hypopituitarism. So we're radiating the pituitary gland. We can cause the pituitary gland just to stop producing any hormone. Now, not the worst thing in the world. You can take hormone replacements, but certainly if we have other options that don't cause that, that might be a better way to go. Visual deterioration. Remember, most of these tumors are benign. They're not cancer. They're never going to become cancer. The reason that we're treating people is for the most part to save their vision. If the treatment that we're doing can cause your vision to get worse just in the treatment itself, again, maybe that's not the best thing to do. And then hypothalamic damage, the hypothalamus is the area right behind the pituitary gland. There have been case reports of damage to this. It's, it's not a huge concern, but it's certainly something that's there. So, now the fun stuff. How do we get to this area? So I'm going to very, very briefly go over transcranial approaches because these generally are not used anymore. Transcranial approach, so this is the head, this is the ear, these are the eyes, patients looking up. This is what's called a, a common perional type incision. So here's the zygoma marked out here, and it's an incision that goes essentially to the midline. Here's the temporalis muscle. This is skin reflected that way. Here's more muscle near the orbit. This is with the muscle taken away. So this is the temporal portion of the bone. This is the frontal portion of the bone. So that's this area here. This temporal area is this area here. We then take the bone away. So that's the dura, the covering of the brain. And here's the brain itself. This is the frontal lobe. This is the sylvian fissure. This is the temporal lobe. And we have to follow this down, so in other words, split the sylvian fissure. 
take the frontal lobe away from the temporal lobe. And this is what we see on a magnified view. Here's the carotid artery, here's the optic nerve, and here's the pituitary tumor behind those structures. So those are, the pituitary tumor is deep to all these things. Again, here's the <coughs> optic nerve, the carotid artery, and the tumor behind here. And you can imagine this distance, this is under a, a microscope, this distance is only several millimeters. To try to take a tumor out from in between these structures and not damage any of these structures is, is a delicate operation. Not to mention the fact that we're retracting on the frontal and temporal lobes. And so there is a, a high risk to these transcranial procedures to get to this. So, looking back at our anatomy, maybe there's another option. So if we're going through the, the entire brain to get to this, well, what if we just went through the nose? These are air spaces up here, so we can actually pass a camera into the nose, or, or a microscope, or just to, to get in there a, a little bit better. And so if we actually go through the nose itself, maybe that's a better route to get to this area. Now, we say that this has sort of been a modern, current state-of-the-art technique. This is actually the x-ray of a mummy, ancient Egyptian mummy. And they realized very early on that maybe the better route, you don't have to go through, drill the brain, they didn't have high-powered you know, drills, they didn't have pneumatic drills, to get into the brain, maybe going through the nose, where the bone here is a little bit softer, it's a little bit more delicate, you can get through it easier, maybe that's a better route. There are some reports that they may have done this in live people, but for the most part, they were doing this as a mummification process, getting into the brain. Here's actually a CAT scan of a mummy, um, where they went through the nose, broke what's called the cribriform plate, which is this area here, and got into the back of the head, and there's a corridor here. This is sort of embalming material, so to speak. This is not the brain in the back, but they actually went in took out the brain through the nose. So this is, again, an older concept, but one that we're sort of revisiting with current surgery. And so if we can get through the nose or through the, the sinuses, we can actually get right to the tumor without going near the rest of the brain. Now, the old way to do it was, a, again, a transphenoidal approach but it's what's called a sublabial incision. So underneath the gum, we would make an incision, we take this retractor, we stick it in, so this is actually through the nose. This is through the gum, we're lifting the nose up and going through the nasal passage with this retractor. Here's a fluoroscopy of that retractor sitting in the nasal cavity and a little probe going up to the cella. So that area right there is the area that we're interested in through this cavity. Then either take a microscope or our loops, we look through this retractor and try to put these instruments through this retractor to get the tumor out. Now, again, this has been a great method. This was originally developed in the 1920s and 1930s and has been done since then and is a very good method for getting this out. Some of the instruments that we see being used are the retractors, but then also these bayoneted instruments because not only do we have to get the instruments into the nose, but we also have to be able to see what we're doing. And so we need these bayoneted instruments so that our hands are not in the way and we can actually see what we're doing while we're operating. But again, maybe there's a better way. <laughs> and so here comes the endoscopic approach. And this is the approach that we've been doing here. And this is the approach that is sort of the up and coming method of doing this. There's only a few centers in the area, in New York actually, that are doing it this way. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, this is absolutely the way this should be done. The camera goes in through the nose. We don't have to make any incisions. We can work through each nostril. And we don't have to worry about being able to see because we have a camera right where we're operating. Here's the arrangement in the operating room. So we have an ENT surgeon neurosurgeon, the scrub, and the anesthesiologist. 
You know, sometimes on these cases, initially, we've been using two scrubs um, just for the ENT portion and the neurosurgical portion, but the truth is they generally don't happen at the same time. ENT is going to be doing their approach through the sinus, just a regular sinus surgery, a uh, regular approach to the sphenoid sinus. Then the ENT will stand there and hold the camera, um, navigate through the sinus, while the neurosurgeon stands and performs the actual tumor resection. So we can see some of the instruments that we'll be using. A lot of what are called pistol grip instruments, so our hands you know, can operate two at the same time. Non-bayoneted curettes. So again, we don't have to worry about bayoneting instruments because our hands are not going to be in the way of what we're seeing. And then the various endoscopes. Now the other development that isn't unique to endoscopic surgery, but something that I've been using exclusively uh, with the endoscopic cases is what's called stereotaxis. So, the old way of doing it was with fluoroscopy. Now, neurosurgery, there, there are two main groups of neurosurgeons. There are spine neurosurgeons and there are cranial neurosurgeons. One of the things I didn't like about spine surgery on top of everything else was wearing that lead all day. Pituitary surgery, up until very recently, required fluoroscopy, required you to wear that lead just so we know that we're in the right spot. Something that we've been doing lately is what's called stereotaxis, which is being able to figure out where we are without having used fluoroscopy. Essentially what the concept is, is setting up an XYZ coordinate system in space. We then put the brain into that coordinate system. We put the tumor into the brain, and now we know exactly where we are. And the way that we do that is with a system called the brain lab system that we have in the operating room. So we have the tower here, we put these markers on the patient's head, and you can see this is what one of the markers looks like on an MRI scan. Here's the pituitary tumor, here are these markers, and the idea is if we tell this machine where these markers are on the patient's head, it can then figure out where the tumor is and know where that is when we put our instruments in and we can navigate directly using that. No fluoroscopy, no x-rays, no wearing lead. We know exactly where we are. So, the different steps of what we're going to do, again, as I mentioned, first ENT is going to do that sinus approach, and so that typically means either removing one of the turbinates or pushing one of the turbinates aside, taking back some of the nasal septum, and just giving us a little room in the sphenoid sinus to be able to look onto the floor of the cell. So this is where we want to get to. But in general, there's all air and sinuses on the way there. Now, once we get to the cella, we have to remove that bone. And so there's a couple of different ways of doing this. Um, one of the ways is using just uh, osteotomes and a hammer, a chisel and a hammer, and, and chiseling out some of the bone. Another way is uh, trying to get a small corridor doing that, and then using kerosins or using some form of rongeur. Um, we can use drills. But you can imagine putting a drill into the nose, it, it jumps around, it, even the smaller drills. And so what we've been using here, and this is sort of the brand new up and coming way of doing this, is something called a Sonopet. <coughs> Sonopet is similar to a CUSA device. Uh, it's an ultrasonic aspirator, but there's an attachment that also uh, takes bone away. Do we have that? We do. Okay. And here's what it looks like. It's this little claw that takes bone away and doesn't affect the soft tissue. And so it just oscillates back and forth and removes this bone. It doesn't jump around, doesn't catch cottonoids in it and spin them around. It, it's, it's a very safe method of taking the bone away. So, once we have the bone away, then we're into the cell itself. And so, removing the tumor from in here uses a series of curettes, ring curettes, um, other forms of enucleators that are called, scooping the tumor out from here, really under direct visualization from the, uh, from the endoscope. 
And so this was one of my very early cases that I did uh, probably close to seven years ago at this point, um, before we had the sonal bed. But here's a, a relatively large recurrent pituitary tube. And our technique is much better, and I will tell you, this is a little bloodier than what we're used to now with some of the newer techniques that we're using. Um, we have the brain lab system, and actually back then we had the fluoroscopy just as a backup in case this wasn't working. So we're going through the sinus now. These are the turbinates. No incisions are made. We're back into the sinus and into the os of the sphenoid. So that's a natural opening back into the sphenoid sinus. open up into the sphenoid sinus, and this is generally done by the ENT surgeon, opening back into the sphenoid sinus and then back biting on the posterior portion of the septum to allow for entry into the cella. And so again, there's the ENT here, the neurosurgeon here. Soft tissue within the uh, Sphenoid sinus. So we're watching the monitor and the brain lab. And then this is going to be the dura back here. So you can see it's starting to form. That's the dura back here. We'll see it on the brain lab. So we're able to see exactly where we are. We'll open up the dura, and that's the tumor coming in. And then we suction out and curette out the tumor. And now it's not projecting great, but what we're also going to see is the normal pituitary back here. So the pituitary, so that's the normal pituitary right back here. And so what we can see is the tumor itself typically has a very soft, almost toothpaste-like consistency that just sort of comes out. Occasionally, they're very fibrous and firm. Um, we can also have meningiomas in this area that look like the pituitary adenomas, and we don't realize them until we get in there. Um, when they're very firm, they can be very difficult to take out through this method. One of the main reasons is that, sort of, as you saw with the anatomy, um, when we're doing a transcranial, we have to work through the optic nerve and the carotid artery. But that also means that we know where they are. When we're going transphenoidal, the optic nerves are behind us. They're on the other side of the tumor from where we're working. The carotid arteries on our, are on either side of us, but they're in bone. They're in the cavernous sinus, and we can't see them. And so there, are some, there is some risk there, in other words, to damaging those areas. One of the other things we have to make sure that it's not in this area are aneurysms. Aneurysms can form in this region, and it's very important, and, and thank God I've never been involved in a case, but I've certainly been around when they've happened, and somebody thinks that they're going after a pituitary tumor, and it's really an aneurysm, and you put a knife into it, and... And then you die. Uh, what do you do so, if you have bleeding in that Right, so if you, so you don't know, right, so if you have bleeding in that area, you can pack it off. Well, bleeding in general, you can take care of. Um, so... There are very nice bipolar instruments and uh, coagulation instruments. You use, uh, so, that's, so that's another method of doing it, but there's, uh, which I'll mention. You can use gel foam, and again, some of the surge of flow and flow, uh, some of the flow seal and surge of flow, some of the newer uh, hemostatic agents are very good at stopping bleeding in this area. But obviously, if you cut into an aneurysm or the carotid artery, it doesn't matter how much of that stuff you have. So there's a couple of different methods of treating that. One is just packing it with as many cottonoids as you can get in there until it, you at least tamponade it. Um, you can put Foley catheters into the nose and blow them up, and that'll tamponade it off. But obviously those things are all temporary. What you need to do then is get the patient right to an angiography suite, and they can go in and yeah, coil it or put a stent in or something like that. And so. We have some of that capability here as well. Um, we're working on getting more neuroendovascular capabilities, but even the, the capabilities that we have now are enough to be able to make that happen.
Some of the other common complications in this area are CSF leaks. So the pituitary gland sits in the cella. That's not in the brain. There's actually an area around the brain called the arachnoid, which is part of the dura. The arachnoid is named that way because it's like a spider web. It's a very thin membrane. Even in normal patients, that's very thin and can rip. Now we're talking about a patient that has a tumor in there, we're putting instruments in, and you can get a tear of that membrane. That can cause what's called a, a leak of cerebral spinal fluid, which in and of itself isn't the most terrible thing in the world, but if fluid can get out, bacteria can get in. And so if we see that, we have to close it. The way that we close it is taking an abdominal fat graft, packing it into the area that helps scar <coughs> things down, we generally use some sort of tissial or duracil, some sort of fibrin glue type material, and we'll put a lumbar drain in. So a drain in the lower back that preferentially drains fluid, drains cerebral spinal fluid from the lower back so that the fluid doesn't come out of the nose and gives the chance that, that a chance to heal. We keep the patients flat, usually for about four or five days. And I will say, in, in close to 100% of the time, that takes care of most small leaks. Occasionally, we have to go back in and do further repairs with vascularized flaps, um, but in general, that controls it. Pituitary dysfunction is another common complication. So we're messing with the pituitary gland. We can either permanently hurt that and cause hormone depletion and cause you to need hormone replacements, or you can get this transient, what's called diabetes insipidus, which is a difficulty controlling the amount of urine that you produce, and you make way too much dilute urine, and your sodium goes very high. This is something we control, and typically this is self-limiting over a course of several days, but something we have to keep a close eye on, and so we're doing Q1 hour urine checks, Q6 hour sodium, and specific gravity checks, and so it's something that we look for. You can get visual dysfunction after surgery. Again, we're pushing on a tumor that is pushing on the optic nerves, and so you can get some transient visual disturbance. Typically, the optic nerves aren't directly damaged when this happens. Um, it, it's temporary, and so that vision does come back if it does happen, but it's possible. Vascular injury, we're right near those carotid arteries, or if more superiorly, the anterior cerebral arteries are stuck to this, there is the possibility of getting a vascular injury, even at a later date, developing a traumatic pseudoaneurysm. So if you had, uh, if you affected the side of the carotid artery over time, you can get pseudoaneurysms or what are called uh, cavernous carotid fistulas, um, and those are possible. And then subtotal resection is something I always talk to patients about because that is very common in this area. Remember, most of these are benign. Our goal is to not make the MRI look perfect and be able to put a picture up on our refrigerator. Our goal is to be able to make your vision better. And so if we decompress the nerve, take the tumor away from the optic nerves, in a very slow-growing tumor, sometimes that's all we need to do. Also, if we can take the tumor away from the nerve, but not risk damaging the carotid artery, the pituitary gland, and pull it away enough that we can then give radiosurgery or some form of radiation, which now will not affect the nerves because the tumor's further away, sometimes that's a method that we choose. So, in terms of overall outcomes, here's that hemangiopericytoma that I showed at the beginning, that 30-year-old girl that had presented. This is postoperatively from an endoscopic approach, the same thing that we did, and really you can see the optic nerves are compressed here, the optic nerve is completely free here, this is the pituitary stalk now that's going down into the cella, her pituitary function is completely intact. Here's the coronal view of that same patient, tumor's gone now, optic nerves, pituitary stalk completely intact, here your carotid arteries, and so we have very good outcomes from this. And so, again, I appreciate all your attention. And we'll see you Any questions? Oh, don't do that. Look at that. Yes. When you were going in, you were curating and suctioning out your tumor. Now, will that be destroying or hurting the tumor you're trying to take out? Do you want to know what that tumor had, anything else in it? Would that be ruining or like 
Yeah, it's so like those bad cells in there spreading it by curating or something. Yeah, we don't spread. So these tumors don't spread anywhere. Um, we do send those samples to pathology. So anything we get in our aspirate, anything we get in the ring curettes, we put uh, in general put traps onto the suctions. And so we're taking all that material and sending it to the pathologist so they can give us an answer. But no, it doesn't spread anything and it doesn't disseminate the cancer. Thursday if you're interested. <laughs> <laughs>